Hi everyone, I'm Goha Vardenian and this is going to be a Q&A video. A while ago on Facebook I had promised that as soon as I reached 3000 subscribers on YouTube I would make one of these and answer all of your questions. And over this weekend I did, so here I am. I wanted to thank everyone who has been watching my videos on this channel, um, on the Strings by Mail channel with the Lessonettes and the Unexplored Repertoire series. Everyone for um, commenting, for liking, for disliking, for asking questions. Uh, it makes it so much more fun to make these videos when I know someone's actually watching on the other end. So thank you. Uh, to answer your questions, so what I did was I read all of the questions that were submitted on Facebook and I've always read all of your comments that are on YouTube. I don't always have time to write back individually, but hopefully with this video I can uh, bulk them all together and answer the questions. There are three questions that get asked the most frequently and there's maybe like another fourth one. And uh, those are what guitar I play, what strings I play, um, how much I practice, and the fourth one is about La Vida Breve. So, I'm going to answer those first. The guitar I play is a 2012 uh, Jean Rompre. He's a Canadian builder from Quebec. And I bought this guitar in 2013. And so it's been a, a year old guitar, but no one used it before me. So I was the first owner. And um, the first thing I saw about this instrument was that the, it was at the GFA and was the back, which is this the most beautiful wood. And um, I just saw Jean walk into the room with the back facing me and I had to just, I had to go try that instrument because it's just so pretty. And uh, so this is, for those of you who might be wondering, it's a Mun Ebony or Moon Ebony, um, the back and sides, instrument and uh, it's cedar, obviously. Um, the construction is a carved back, so it's just carved, I don't know if you'll be able to tell on a video, but it's a little bit, it's rounder. Uh, the sides are doubled and uh, it's not laminated. It's actually the same wood. It's just in two layers, both ebony. And so it makes the guitar quite heavy, which I actually prefer because it feels really nice in my hands to have that weight um, sitting in my lap. And, um, and then obviously the front is cedar. It's not double top. That's a question I get asked a lot. It's just single top and foam. Uh, when I asked John, he told me that there is radial bracing. So there's braces coming out from either side of the bridge and there's no bracing on the back because it is carved and uh, that's what makes it kind of heavy. The The fretboard on the back of the fretboard is also ebony but it's a different kind. I can't remember the wood. Um, I'll just have to double check later. But anyway, so that's the guitar I play. I really, really like it. I love it for its fullness, for the volume, for the power that it has um, and the ability to, to sustain. I can play piano on it and it will sustain and I can play loud on it. It almost it doesn't break no matter how much I push it. Um, so yeah, I hope to use this instrument for a very long time. In terms of strings, um, over the years I have used uh, really not too many strings. I, for about 10 years or so, I've been using Augustine Regals for my trebles. And I've also used the Imperials. Honestly, I kind of feel like they're almost the same. I know it says high tension for the Regals, but they don't, they don't feel like high tension when you put them on the guitar. Um, and I've always come back to Canti Savarez Cantiga basses because I've also absolutely loved them. But recently I have changed to Royal Classics um, recital strings. And I find that their basses are just as good as the Savarez basses. So I didn't have to compromise anything because I absolutely love the Cantiga basses. So these basses are basically just, just the same. They're just as full, um, just as powerful. And the trebles, I really love the, um, the trebles because they feel sort of, the, word, the only word I can come up with is kind of elastic under my fingers so I feel like there's a good grip to them. Um, they're nylon strings. I don't really like carbon strings because I feel like the sound is a little bit too pointy for me and because they're thinner they they wear out my nail before I wear out the string so I quit using um, carbon strings even though I played those for many years as well. So I used nylon strings and uh, that's the strings I use now. Um, Royal Classic recital strings medium tension. All the strings I use are medium tension. For a little while I also used the Hanebach um, 815s which I also liked. So somebody asked me if I have um, if I have like concert strings versus practice strings. I don't really do that. Um, I don't really like switching them around. Um, I change my strings every two weeks but I I always stick with the same ones that I use. If, the, if these are the strings I use now, I will practice on them, I will record on them, I will play the concerts on them. So I don't really have specific um, 
different strings for different things. And so I, I get used to them, so I don't really want to switch them around. So these are really the, the strings that I I gr gravitate towards. Uh, for the last year, it's been this, but for many, many years, it's been the Savarez Cantigas and the Augustine Regals, and for a little while, the Hanebach 815s. And there's obviously so many strings out there, and hopefully in the future, I will be able to try them all. Um, so as I said, I always use nylon strings. I've tried titanium, I've tried carbon. I don't really like them for me personally. And I always use normal tension. And the reason is um, I feel like I don't really need any more volume than I already have. Um, I do play fairly loud and my guitar is fairly loud. Uh, anytime I've tried high, high tension strings, of course it allows you to play even louder before buzzing, but the louder you play in the right hand, the harder you have to press in the left hand, which makes the whole playing experience more difficult. And when you're flying around the fretboard, that extra pressure you have to use to um, to press and release and press and release on hard tension strings, it just tires out my hand even more. So I don't really, I don't really use them like ever. Um, and then, so next question about practicing. Personally, I, when I was good and I was practicing uh, a lot at school and uh, yeah, mostly when I was at school because you have the luxury of all the time in the world other than your classes. I would practice about four hours every single day with having a day off here and there. Um, and I feel like that's like really my personal limit, three to four hours. Um, I can count on one hand how many times I've practiced more than four hours. And that's just because I could force myself to, six, so to sit there for six hours and just play and play and play. But what I found was that after those four, I'm not really being productive at all. I'm, I'm forcing myself to play just so I can feel better about my, myself. I'm like, oh, I practiced six hours. But I didn't really accomplish anything. And at the end, I just like walked away with just being tired from sitting in that position. And even though I, I sit in a pretty, you know, good posture and comfortable way, uh, six hours on a chair, even throughout the day, it's a long time. So, and your brain gets tired. I feel like it's more, and you've probably heard this a bazillion times from everyone, but it really is more important to concentrate on quality versus quantity. You can, you can play for six hours and at the end of the day not really accomplish much, or you can play for three hours or two hours and really work on something and really fix something. Um, that can be done even in like 15 minutes. If it's a small enough section you're working on, you can pick up the guitar, practice for 15, 20 minutes and fix those two measures. Um, or you can play the piece over and over again from beginning to end for six hours straight and not really walk away with anything that's been improved. So nowadays, because, you know, there is life and uh, you have to do things other than play the guitar, I can't really practice four hours every single day just because there isn't enough time um, between doing videos, teaching, writing a book or answering emails. Everything adds up where you are, I don't know, is it 16 hours that you are awake uh, during the day? They run out pretty quickly. Um, so whenever I have a concert coming up, I will force myself and I will prioritize practicing. So I will practice four hours every single day. But if I have the luxury of having a little break between performances, I will probably maybe even skip a day or two. Don't tell anyone. Um, but yeah, so usually to really to really improve and when you really have something to work on or when I really have something to work on, I, I practice between three to four hours. Um, and somebody else asked if I do it every single day. And that would be, yes, other than those breaks. But when you're in a learning process, and when I was at school, that's like the better example, um, because those of you who are watching are probably not professionally, you know, musicians who are traveling all over the place and don't have the practice. You're probably in a learning process. So if, you, if you're in a learning process, doing it every single day um, is more important than cramming it over the weekend, for example. So even if you have 20 minutes in the morning to just to do some technical exercises, but doing it every single day of the week is better than not doing it for three days and then having this four hour window in, in um, on a Sunday and just cramming everything in. First of all, um, that's not very healthy, especially if you skip days and then your body is not used to playing for four hours and then you're just cramming everything in, you're more, you would be more prone to, to injuring yourself and hurting yourself because you just don't have the stamina. But if you practice every single day, little by little, it might feel like it's not a lot, but it's better than 
not doing anything and then cramming. Um, so I do, I, when I was at school, I would practice every single day. But of course, I would also take breaks because it is a physical skill and it also is a mental skill. And our brain, my brain gets more tired um, faster than my hands do. So that's why I actually don't play six hours because at the end, it's like my brain is shut off and I'm just moving my fingers. I can still move my fingers, but I'm not paying attention. So it's not getting any better. So I do practice every single day. And um, yeah, so concentrate on the quality and not really how many hours you clocked in at the end. Um, and then the fourth question that's like I get the most emails about is about the arrangement of La Vida Breve. And that arrangement I did not do 100% myself. I used Keigo Fuji's arrangement that is available on YouTube, um, on Google if you just Google it, uh, La Vida Breve and then Keigo Fuji. A PDF, a handwritten PDF file will come up at some point. And uh, so I used that as a, um, as a reference for the notes. So I didn't, I didn't really feel like rewriting from a piano score or uh, uh, an orchestra score because that's a lot of hours. So I used that as a reference of something that's already reduced. However, um, I did change things about it. Um, I changed some of the accompaniment where it appears, whether it's like in a lower octave or a higher octave. I changed, um, I added in the middle section where there are two voices, two scale, scalier voices interacting with each other. Um, it's very noticeable when you play with two guitars, but that guitar one and two, in, in Keigo Fuji's version, one of the notes was taken out, or a couple of notes were taken out from these guitar two's ascending scales. So I've made sure that I put all of those notes back. However, when you put those notes back, you have to take something away because we really only have four fingers to work with. So I took one of the ornaments out from the first guitar. So now I felt like that line in the second guitar was more important than the ornament in the first guitar. So that was an alternation I made um, right before the, the, like the end where you have that ascend, ascending and descending scale. Usually, even in the two guitar version, um, the like one of the more important melody lines appears on the third string. Um, I changed it up to the first string in a higher octave because when you listen to the orchestra, that that is more prevalent. Like you can hear it a lot more, and I felt like on the third string it was getting hidden, and it was very hard to hear. So it ended up sounding more like there is no melody at all. So I changed the octave for that, put it higher up, and um, of course I always change fingerings to basically anything I play, so I changed a lot of the fingerings to make it work for my hands. Um, and it's gonna be very individual for everyone, but I start. I try to stick with um, the easiest way I can finger something. Not necessarily by taking all the notes out, but trying to play all the notes that I want to, but play them in a way that's um, easier and smoother, so I have to practice less. But So that's what I did. So it's not really identical to what you will find, but um, I didn't write the changes down because Again, it would take me so much longer to to type everything up in Sibelius or Finale or handwrite or whatever. Um, so I just decided to memorize what I was changing and not bother with changing it on the score. Um, I didn't know people would be so interested, so I didn't really think of that. But maybe in the future when I have the time, I will just write everything the way I'm playing it and make it available. But for now, that's what's been done. I think that's it for like the most frequently asked questions. And then I had some questions um, that were submitted on Facebook. So one of them was about technique. And the question is, uh, what is important for you? Um, like, what do you do every day? How do you prepare a new piece from the beginning of the study to the end? And um, technique-wise, uh, what how I think about technique is, I think of it as a toolbox that we need for making music. So if you're gonna make anything, um, you need certain tools and that's what I see technique as. So that means that you have to be able to do everything that is um, that is necessary for all the different kinds of pieces that you're going to play. That means you have to have good arpeggios, you have to have good tremolo, good scales, rest stroke and free stroke, um, good slurs, good glissando, um, just everything you can think of. Mostly those end up being like the main categories and everything else is sort of like a subcategory of those. Um, I play ar arpeggios. I don't really do like every single combination I could possibly come up with, even though there are many method books that have a whole uh, formulas of different arpeggio combinations. I just kind of stick to 
um, a six tuplet arpeggio that has all four fingers and uh, and then some with like just three fingers and I change between I and M and A and M. Um, so I do those arpeggios, I do scales. Most of the time I play my scales right stroke, but that's also because most of the time I play Spanish music. So um, for me, it fits. If I were to play more um, Baroque music, like Scarlatti or Bach, um, I would most likely play all free stroke scales for those. And that's what I've done um, with any time I've played those pieces. If I'm playing classical repertoire, it depends on your situation. Sometimes it would be free stroke, sometimes it would be rest stroke. The idea is the way I look at it, the free stroke, free stroke, rest stroke thing. Um, I see it as it's no one's business what stroke I'm using as long as it sounds good. So if you're going to play rest stroke and it's going to sound super heavy, then it's probably not a good idea to use the rest stroke. But if you're going to use rest stroke and it's going to sound just as light and um, legato and free, then it really doesn't matter what you're using as long as you're not muting any other strings. Same thing with free stroke. If you can make the free stroke sound as full and as powerful as you can do with the rest stroke, then do free stroke. Because at the end of the day, it's really about the music um, that you are presenting and how you do it. It doesn't really matter as long as you can make it sound good. But it does mean that you have to have the ability to control the rest stroke, the free stroke, so that they're basically not you can't differentiate between them as you're playing them i found myself in some situations where i would start a scale free stroke and and then change to rest stroke and it just it would just become a natural um crescendo without me having to make the effort of making a crescendo i just changed the stroke and all of a sudden this is gradual crescendo so if you have those tools that tools at your disposal and you can do that um, for me personally what i probably practice the most or what i feel is lacking when I don't practice is left hand. Um, I don't really practice a lot of right hand. It just sort of comes it, after so many years, it just comes naturally. But the left hand, if I don't practice slurs for a while, um, I, I feel that when I play pieces, it's more difficult. My slurs aren't even. So for me, I concentrate more on left hand technique than I do on, on right hand, unless I've taken a long break from playing uh, in which case I have to do both just to kind of warm up and catch up and uh, make sure my hands are back in shape so that's that's what I do technique wise um, arpeggio scales um, tremolo is one of those things that requires maintenance so just because you had tremolo that sounded good a year ago <laughs> doesn't mean it'll sound good a year later if you don't practice it every single day so that's something that I have to maintain um, just to make sure it's there and then and then slurs with the left hand and sometimes, I, just to <laughs> challenge myself, I will do the slur exercises that are in different books. I, I use Carl um slurs, um, Abel Carlevaro's book for slurs, and sometimes I add a bar to it just to make it more challenging because I find that in pieces most of the time, well, not most of the time, but a lot of times, you end up having to do slurs when your first finger is barring. So it's a, it obviously makes more sense to, um, to practice them that way as well. What else? So that would be for practicing. The other question which was interesting was about how I prepare a piece from the beginning to the end. And um, and that's, 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 I guess, different for everyone. But at least for me, um, the question actually referenced Valses Poeticos because for those of you who follow me on Twitter and Facebook uh, have seen all the practice videos I've posted of those pieces as I started learning them. And it also includes like how long it takes uh, for me to, to practice them and to, to put it onto a concert. So it really does depend on the piece that you are playing, the difficulty of it, the length of it. But I'll bring the example on the valses um, just because that's what's new for me now. The valses are, there are eight of them. It's about 15 minutes of music, but it's also Spanish music. So Spanish music is most of the time, personally for me, is easier to memorize than, let's say, Baroque music. So I started playing them, like first sight reading them and getting familiar with the fingering and stuff in uh, June 2016. So it's like about nine months ago or so. And the first couple of months were sort of rough. I was like, oh my God, these are so hard. I don't know if I can play them. And it was mostly because it's some of the chords and stuff, they don't really they don't really fit the guitar. It's like it's not idiomatic to the instrument. Be and some of the keys are not the keys that we play in. Like it has a lot of flats and we don't really play in a lot of flat keys. And and there's a reason for that. If you're playing in a flat key, how many open strings you can play reduces with the amount of flats you have. So if you have 
two flats, that already means that you can't play your E strings. Two E strings, you cannot play them open and you can't play your B string open. You add another flat and you can't play your A string open. So with four strings out of play, it makes the fingering more difficult and more difficult to play. So it explains why we play in A major a lot or A minor or E. But anyway, so the first couple of months, I sort of got familiar with the waltzes, for, with all of them, but they were really rough. And then I had to take a break and practice my other repertoire because I had a concert coming up. So I took maybe three weeks off and didn't play the waltzes at all. And then I came back to them three weeks later and what surprised me was I actually, as soon as I remembered what they were, it sounded better than the last day I practiced them after a continuous three week process. So having that mental break from it actually helped I guess I slept on it, you know, and it's just sort of um, solidified in my brain. So from, I'd say, October, um, I've been working on them more continuously. And for me, the process is, as I guess, follows. So I, I learn the piece, I sight read it as many times as I, I can. And then uh, once I'm familiar with the whole thing and I know what to expect, even if it's on the 10th page, then I go back and I start breaking it into sections and try to learn it section to section. Um, with the waltzes, it was incredibly easy to do because there are eight of them, so there's an automatic break of eight pieces. And then each waltz is an ABA form, except for like one of them. So it has very clear sections. So I would say, okay, today I'm going to learn this waltz and either it's gonna be the A and B section or it's just gonna be both, uh, just the A and then the B. So I broke it down into sections and I say the month of October I spent trying to just raise the level and the quality and almost memorize them. Um, I think by the end of November, that was the goal I gave myself, that by the end of November, I will be able to play the waltzes from memory. I can't remember if I reached it, but it was close to that point where I'm like, okay, now I can just not look at the music at all and play from memory. And when I'm working on it, um, it's kind of all built in or interwaved together. Um, of course, in the beginning, it might not be very clean because I'm just reading the music and I don't know what to expect. But as I start to work on it, I'm working on perfecting them, even when it's at the snail slow tempo, like, I don't know, 60 on the metronome for an eighth note or whatever. But I'm trying to, in that process while I'm learning them, also practice the technical part of it and um, try to perfect it that way. That way, I'm not teaching my fingers to do anything improperly or messy, so I'm really not teaching them to do any bad habits. And that you can only do when it's really slow. And um, then the month of December and February, I was sort of, they got better and more fluent and I was gaining tempo. And um, I forgot to mention, but I always use the metronome. So after the first stage of the reading process is done, and I'm in the process of actually learning the waltz, where I can predict what's coming next. And even though the music is in front of me, um, I'm not really reading anymore, but I'm sort of, I know what's coming. It's just there for a security purpose. I turn on the metronome at a very slow tempo just so that I learn the proper rhythm because what happens a lot of times when you practice without the metronome you sort of you you might say like you're being more musical with it which is probably true but your musicality is influenced by the difficulties in the piece so you don't really know whether you want to do that rubato because you want to do that rubato or because your fingers can't play it at the right tempo and you're doing the rubato to make it to survive so I make sure I do it with the metronome so that the rhythm, the essence, like the pulse of the piece is 100% what the composer intended. And then when I'm there and I'm basically, I can play it with the metronome very close to the tempo that it was intended to, then I will start practicing sometimes without the metronome just so that I can then um, put in the musical ideas that I want, that I want, not what my fingers want, but what I want. So then it's sort of, it's, I feel like it's more um, more honest musically rather than I'm slowing down because I can't do something. So, and I also check back in with the metronome because a lot of times it'll still creep in as the tempo raises and your hands aren't really ready to do it, you might still slow it down because you your fingers aren't ready. So I would practice without the metronome, try to make it as musical as I can, and then I will turn on the metronome just to see like how much I've deviated from it. Once you know it well enough, obviously you um, you start playing without the metronome because you don't want to sound like a machine. So at some point, I, I just don't practice with the metronome until it's like I've played it without the metronome enough times where I just want to tweak it and make sure I haven't deviated too much. So, you know, once in a while I will turn it back on 
and practice it that way. So in it wasn't until like January, so from June until January where, that, where I felt like I can play all eight of them from beginning to end and actually survive because they're really, they, seem, they don't seem that hard sometimes when you watch someone play them, but they're really hard and you need the stamina to get to the end. And the last waltz is like the, um, not the repeat, but the, the very last one is like the hardest one of them all. And you have to have the stamina to be able to play it at the tempo it's supposed to be and not sound so um, difficult and so um, heavy and like not musical. So I think it was January where I felt like, huh, there is hope that I might be able to perform it in like a month or six weeks or eight weeks from now. And at that point I had a performance coming up in, in March. So it was still kind of on and off. So I think maybe in mid-February, I, I just kind of had a run through and I realized like, okay, if I practice for another three weeks in this state, in this process, I will probably get to a point where I can perform it. And then someone asked me if there is like a certain point um, where you just know. And um, for that, I would have to say there isn't really one point because th that you know that you're supposed to perform. There isn't really any like one point because you get it to a stage where you can play it to your, at least to your opinion, like really well um, for yourself and then maybe for a close family member um, or a friend or whatever. But then there is still that point where you have to learn how to perform it. And at some point you just have to try it because if I didn't just give it a shot and play it in front of an audience, I wouldn't really know if I, I could do it. So once I could do it um, really consistently well alone in my in my practice room, in my apartment, then I would, I just decided like, okay, I'm gonna program this. And then you give it a shot on stage. And you can't, of course, you have to know that it's it's ready, like your memory has to be solid you have to be able to play it at the tempo it's supposed to be maybe a little bit under but it has to be a complete piece but even then when you're performing it it's not really done because as you perform the piece more and more times it matures and i feel like that's when actually a piece matures is when you perform it doesn't matter how much you practice in the practice room until you play it for people it won't come to its final stage so in each time I performed, it sounded better. The first time I performed, I found out that I one of the sections I didn't know as well as I thought I did. So there was like a memory slip where I wasn't expecting it. So then when I came home between that performance and the next one, I visualized it even more. And uh, then the next time I performed, that section was great. And another section kind of showed its weakness. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know I was gonna, that was going to happen. Um, then you come back and you work on it some more and then the third performance was a little bit better and now like there's a fourth one coming up in like a month and a half or a month I guess from now and now I, I kind of have that in my bag and I still feel like it probably needs another five six months of playing already at like the finalized version until it really matures and things change so the way I after even almost a year of practicing it I don't think it has come to a point where it's final because I think it always changes. Um, even pieces that I've played for many, many years, the more I play them, the more they change and the more comfortable I become with it and the more free you become with making the music because the more you play it, the more the technique becomes something that's just not noticeable anymore. You just sort of, your fingers do what you want them to do. And that way you can really be, you can really be musical with it and put the musical ideas in it that you want. So it's a long process and it really depends on the piece. So particularly for that one, it's something that's Spanish music, which makes it a little bit easier for me personally, but it's 15 minutes, which is another one thing that's difficult. It's also an arrangement. It's not uh, authentically for the guitar, so it's different. Um, and I've never played it before. Um, another example would be the grand solo, which I've played about 12 years ago and then did not play it at all between then and now. But then when I picked it up, it, it's classical repertoire, which is very easy to memorize because it's very, you know, the the chords are pretty easy and straightforward. Um, it's Spanish and it's something I've played before. So it came back into my fingers a lot faster. So that it maybe took me like two months or so um, from the days of resurrection to the day of performance where it was decent. But I still, but I hadn't really performed it before. So that piece also needs to see, to mature on stage as well. So that's the question about um, so the performance. And uh, I think there were a couple of questions about uh, when, like I started practicing on my own. 
and all of that. Um, so this question comes from someone that I know that, uh, that she teaches a lot of little kids. And for those of you who don't know, I've been playing guitar since I was five. And for my, in my case, it's been, it's, it's different because my first teacher was my, my dad. So I didn't actually practice on my own until I was 13 or 14. And um, it's in a way a luxury because um, the first, the most important years, I guess, of that developmental stage where your, your, your hands are learning how to use the instrument, the physical skill, I was lucky enough to have supervision on a daily basis. So I never really practiced on my own but I'd rather I had lessons every single day with my dad. And those lesson, lessons were like anywhere between 15 minutes, half an hour, maybe an hour. I really doubt it though. I wasn't the kind of kid who would uh, last with a guitar for an hour because I was just too concerned with playing with my friends outside. So whenever he could grab me in between running around from picking up one toy to the next, he would just like sit me down and uh, maybe play for like 15 minutes before I could go out and play with my friends again. So, but what helped was that those 15 minutes were better used than the hour I would have used on my own trying to figure things out and maybe learn the wrong technique. Um, it's not even about the wrong notes. Notes are the easiest things you can fix. But if you're spending six days practicing with like a bad, bad hand position, and then you go to your teacher and they have to correct it and then you have to spend another six days trying to undo what you did, it takes more, um, it seems more inefficient and you're, t you're learning bad habits that you don't want to have. So in my case, I was just lucky enough to have it in home. So I didn't really get a chance to learn bad technique. Um, but I never really practiced on my own until I got to, um, when I came here and I studied with Antigone Goni at the Juilliard Pre-College Division, that was the first time I had a teacher that was outside of family, outside of my dad and uh, someone I couldn't argue with because she's not my dad. But, and I had to listen to everything she had to say. So. That was the first time where like, okay, I went, I had my lesson on a Saturday and then out of respect, my dad did not meddle into like my practicing session between the weeks. So it was when I started practicing on my own, the rest um, of the six days of the week. By that time I was already 13 or 14. Um, so I already had um, eight years of playing experience and there wasn't really anything I could have done wrong to my hands. Um, Cause it was so ingrained already the way I played. So, so yeah, so I'd say I was 13, 14, but that's, of course, I understand it's not a realistic solution to everyone because most of the time you do have that weekly lesson and you have to go and you have to practice at home. What I do with um, the younger students that I teach is that I almost, I discourage them from practicing too much, especially in the beginning stage, especially if I'm in the process of trying to fix their hand position, if they were doing something wrong with it. Um, just so that they don't solidify bad bad technique, bad habits. I'd rather they only play, you know, 30 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, because then there is less harm done in case it's wrong, and there is still good done if it's right. So that way, in the beginning stages, um, I can supervise the, month, the, the weekly lessons that hour, and then they can have less time to, um, to do anything bad. And over time, when it's starts to feel more solid, then you encourage to practice more. And also just the amount of pieces you have to play, etc. you find that, uh, you know, the amount of time you're devoting is either enough or isn't enough. So I think that's it. Um, I don't see any, oh, there's a question about like memorization. And I sort of covered it when I was talking about the, the practicing. For me, memory just comes sort of naturally. If I do something enough times, I, I will remember it. But um, there are certain things like Baroque music, for example, it's a little bit more, it's more complex and it takes longer and visualizing helps absolutely a lo like a lot. Um, just to be able to concentrate without the guitar in your hand and concentrate on where your fingers are going to play, it really reveals how little you know the piece. So if I'm playing a Bach fugue, for example, and I can play it through from memory, um, as soon as I'm trying to visualize where where I have to play, I realized I don't actually know it. So when um, I used to play more Bach when I was at school and now it just, um, it takes a lot of maintenance. So as much as I love Bach because of the maintenance that it takes and the amount of time that it takes to prepare something and present, I sort of haven't really put that in my program a lot. But I remember when I was working on it in, uh, in undergrad and in grad school, 
it was a lot of times, a lot of hours spent um, visualizing the suites, all of the movements um, from the beginning to end. Um, for my senior recital in undergrad, I was playing the, the E major, the 1006, and I would go to bed um, and I could, if as soon as I closed my eyes, I could see those notes in my head because I had visualized it so much and I've played it slowly so much that when I close my eyes, I'm like fingering the gavotte in my, in my head before I fall asleep, just automatically. So um, visualizing from memory helps. And it takes, um, it takes practice too. You have to develop that mental stamina, the, the stamina to, uh, to be able to concentrate for that amount of time. To, to visualize. So you have to start little. Um, you might say two measures, three measures, and each time increase it and do it without the guitar and see if you can recall where your fingers go on a fretboard. Um, and then over time, with patience, it gets easier and you will be able to visualize an entire um, suite or, or piece or whatever that is. So I think that's, that's it um, in terms of questions. So um, if you like these kind of videos, please let me know and in the comments, on Facebook, on Twitter, email. I read them all. As I mentioned, I don't always ha have time to reply to every single question, but I do read them and I try to get back to you as, as soon as I can. But if, if you like them, if you have any other questions, ask away and time to time I will touch back and um, make all, this, all of the, the quick Q&A videos again. And thanks again for watching for all of the channels here and Strings by Mail. Uh, it really it really means a lot and it makes it uh, so much more fun because I know someone's there and uh, maybe even benefiting from from the videos. So thank you. And I'll see you in the next video.